えー、皆様、えー、本日は大変お寒い中、ようこそお越しくださいました。えー、ご紹介いただきました、私、笹川平和財団の理事長をしております、須波でございます。えー、本日の、えー、講演会はあ、米国よりフィリップ・デイビッドソン、元インド太平洋軍司令官をお迎え、えーお、お招きいたしました、えー。本日の講演会ですけれども、オンラインでの生配信も行っておりますが、あ大変多くの方にご登録ご視聴をいただいていると聞いておりますご来場の皆様そしてオンラインでご視聴くださっている皆様に御礼を申し上げますこの度デイビッドソン提督は我々の姉妹団体であります笹川平和財団米国のプログラムの一環でこの後あの登壇していただきます秋元会長とともに来日をされておりますこの機会にぜひ講演会をとお願いをさせていただき、本日、この笹川平和財団、米国との協力のもと、この講演会が実現いたしました。デイビッドソン提督の詳しいご略歴は、皆様のお手元の資料をご覧いただきたいと思いますが、そちらにも書かれておりますとおり、少し前まで、米国最古、そして最大の戦闘司令部を率いるインド太平洋軍司令官をお務めいらっしゃいました。地球の半分にもなるインド太平洋全域の米軍活動全般の責任者という重責を担われていたわけですが、退役され、今回は初めて個人としての来日の機会となったと伺っています。えー、まあちょうど1年前、2022年2月24日にえウクライロシアのウクライナ侵攻があり、私たちはまさかという驚きとウクライナで起きている、そんな戦争の現実に驚き、心を痛めております。そして、この世界の安全保障環境がさらに困難な状況を迎えている現実に向き合ってまいりました。我々が住む東アジアは、まあ、中国という大国を隣国として、そしてまた北朝鮮の脅威もある中、ロシアのウクライナ侵攻という現実が、この地域でどのような影響を与えるのかという不安を抱いてまいりました。そうした中、昨年10月に公開されたナショナルセキュリティストラテジーの中では、米国は中国を唯一の競争相手と位置づけましたが、ロシアと中国、欧州とアジアを前に、どのような安全保障戦略、そして外交政策を米国が取っていくのかということに、今日はお話を聞けると思っております。えー、日本、えー、我が国も戦略三文書を公開された、今、さまざまな議論がなされている日米同盟の役割はどのように変化をし、また具体的にどのような課題が生じていて、対応や運用が必要となっていくのでしょうか。本日、デイビッドソン提督にお話を伺い、そして秋元会長、そして事務所さんの議論をお伺いできるのを非常に楽しみにしております。それでは、デイビッドソン提督にお話をいただきます。提督、どうぞ、およろしくお願いいたします。Thank you, Dr. Tsunami, for your very gracious introduction. I can't tell all of you how pleased I am to be in Tokyo,、um, both in the environment post、uh, COVID 19, but also as a private citizen for the first time, because every time I've been here before, I've been in uniform. It's wonderful to see so many friends from Japan and the USA here in Tokyo. And I have to especially acknowledge. The very good work of the Sasakawa Peace Foundation and the Sasakawa Peace Foundation USA. Its, very, its gracious patron, Yohei Sasakawa, and of course, for Sasakawa Peace Foundation USA, its chairman, Satohiro Akamoto. I'm very proud to be associated with an organization so dedicated to the advancement of US Japan relations and the deepening of our alliance. I intend to speak for about 15 or 20 minutes, and then we will have a short、uh, discussion up here immediately following. I have said it over and over again there is no more important alliance to the idea of a free and open Indo Pacific than the US Japan alliance. 
For all of you working to deepen that alliance, I thank you. It is the most important alliance work in the world. I am so pleased to have seen the overwhelming developments in our alliance these last few weeks. In Japan, certainly, but those agreed to in January uh, in the United States as well. And let's face it, there is no better description of a successful alliance engagement than to have the entire month of January named for Japan. Of course, you know why these alliance developments were so important. The economic and security developments here in Asia alone seem obvi enough, obvious enough to you and I, but Russia's assault and invasion of Ukraine make the risks of authoritarian powers absolutely clear. As I say, we are still seeing in real time what authoritarian powers are truly capable of even in the 21st century. Now, I spoke quite frequently all across the United States last year. I did so largely because I thought it important to remind Americans how the risk of conflict, even as far away as a place like Ukraine, affects not only American interests, but in turn, our long-term prosperity and security. I reminded these audiences of what Thomas Paine, the author of the Revolutionary War pamphlet, Common Sense, had to say. And that is that the cause of America is in great measure the cause of all mankind. And I reminded them that that cause isn't nebulous. That cause is inalienable in the American rhetoric, as our founders outlined. We in America know them simply as life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. In these engagements, I went on to recount all the ways that Putin had told us what he intended to do in advance and the strategic signals that Russia sent that foreshadowed the assault and invasion of Ukraine. I then went on to outline all the ways that the People's Republic of China was changing the security environment here in Asia and signaling their pernicious intentions as well. And with that, what the impacts would be economically and militarily in Asia and the United States if there was ever conflict in the East China Sea or Taiwan Strait. I reminded these audiences that this is the real world, that life and liberty was truly what was at stake, not just in Ukraine, but here in the Indo-Pacific, if we, the United States, and our allies and partners did not oppose authoritarianism, whether it seemed near or far, for the cause of all mankind, as Thomas Paine told us. These audiences, some of them small town civic groups, some of them much more elite policy influencers, and many in between, understood what it meant. Some people in these audiences gasped at the conditions the Ukrainians are suffering, as well as the potential impacts in lives lost and in economic damage if other conflicts were to happen elsewhere. Further, and most importantly, these, audience, these audiences seem to embrace the idea that it was worth the cost and effort now to prevent conflict and deter war, and they would ask what it takes to do so. So bear that in mind for just one minute. Now, many of you know my statement of nearly two years ago now. I was asked, what does China's activities do to your timeline if you are extrapolating out with regard to any potential conflict or timeline in the Taiwan Strait? And as you all know, I said, I think our concerns are manifest this decade, and in fact, in the next six years. That made a little news at the time, wasn't necessarily universally embraced in the days immediately after. But since, 
has gained quite a bit of traction in the United States and abroad. So what of the security environment right now here in Asia? And, excuse me, here in Asia and in Europe. First, clearly Russia's assault on Ukraine grinds on with no clear outcome in sight and the potential for spring offensives in the wind. The three involved parties, Russia and Ukraine, of course, but NATO, or more fairly, the rules-based international order, these three parties are in a position where they cannot afford to lose, or at least cannot appear to lose. Putin has cast, has cast this conflict for the Russian people in terms of the Great War and a war against fascism, making it appear to the Russian people that the outcome for Russia is existential. President Zelensky and Ukraine know that an outcome where Russia occupies some portion of Ukraine will only allow Russia to rest, rearm, and reset for potentially renewed assault on Kyiv, the capital, or more widely across Ukraine, perhaps months away or even years away. NATO and the international order cannot afford to lose because we know it will fundamentally recast the security relationships not only in Europe, but probably globally, and in a way that undermines not only our physical security, but our long-term economic security as well. In the Indo-Pacific, as I've said before, the PRC is definitely taking a lesson or three from the Russia-Ukraine conflict. You know all too well the baseline of PRC activity in the region over the last several years. Just a few of them, the staggering growth in the capability and size of the PLA. There has been the economic coercion of Japan, the Republic of Korea, Australia, Canada, and others, as far away as Europe. The militarization of artificial features in the South China Sea, the enslavement of the Uyghurs in Xinjiang, the implementation of the national security law in Hong Kong. More than any other thing, Asia felt that in the last four years. There have been the incursions of air and maritime assets in and around the Senkaku Islands, the clash with India's troops along the line of actual control, the increases in PLA air and maritime activity with and without Russia near Taiwan, near Japan, and near the U.S. territories of Guam and the Commonwealth of the Northern Marianas Islands. That is the baseline. And since last summer, well, just a couple, Chairman Xi has solidified his leadership of the PRC for another five years and reaffirmed just last October that the party will never promise to abandon the use of force with respect to reunification with Taiwan. The PLA's air and maritime activities in and around the Taiwan Strait are higher than ever. As just one metric, the number of PLA violations of Taiwan's air defense identification zone are nearly twice those of 2021. PLA provocations in the immediate wake of then Speaker Pelosi's visit to Taiwan were as significant as any from the PRC in the last 65 years. Politically, there has been the calamitous exit from the zero COVID policy, as well as the first signs of economic headwinds, both in the PRC. And of course, elsewhere in Northeast Asia, there are renewed missile provocations and threats from the people's, uh, excuse me, the Democratic People's Republic of Korea. Now, there are three very encouraging developments that must be noted. First, the international order remains firmly opposed to Russia's assault on Ukraine. Economic sanctions against Russia were swiftly applied, not only by NATO and Eastern European nations, but also all nations that believe in the principles of free and open, like Japan. 
reinforcing the international order and demonstrating the resiliency of the international order's collective will. Further, energy supplies have been rerouted and aid continues to flow to Ukraine. Ukraine has fought bravely and remains resolute in its defense. The power of unanimity across the NATO alliance is noteworthy as well. These are lessons for the international community of nations, the rules-based international order, if you will, and our mutual interests in the rule of law and a free and open world. Second, as the description Japanuary can only attest, the U.S. and Japan have deepened their alliance. The extension of Article 5 of the Defense Treaty to space assets, the agreement to begin some improvements to our operational design and military posture with the reorganization for a Marine littoral regiment and the establishment of a composite watercraft company in Japan. And importantly, most importantly, the recognition that our two nations' national security and defense strategies have converged paves the way for even more collaboration and development. These are all key to the deepening of our alliance. I also must add the incredible developments in our economic cooperation in semiconductor, artificial intelligence, biotech, supply chains, as well as in critical infrastructure and cybersecurity. There are still other just as noteworthy developments, but it is safe to say that this past year has been the most remarkable one for our alliance in more than 60 years. Perhaps the most remarkable one necessary for a free and open Indo-Pacific in the 21st century. Third, Japan's new security policy is a critical development in the ability to help deter the PRC from misadventure in the Taiwan Strait, the East China Sea, and more broadly in the Indo-Pacific. This truly historic new policy, the three new documents, including the stated increase in defense and national security related investment to nearly 2% of GDP, the policy to possess counterattack capabilities, the strengthening of cybersecurity practices and development of cyber and space forces and capabilities, new access agreements for the UK and Australia, and the clear articulation identifying the PRC as Japan's greatest strategic challenge are frankly a game changer in the region. All three of these developments in the last year or so are almost unarguably positive. Still, more is needed. More is needed from our alliance, more is needed from the international community, and of course, more is needed from the PRC to ensure freedoms here in the Indo-Pacific. Time, time is still of the essence. I said it all across America last year. A failure of deterrence in the Taiwan Strait or elsewhere in the East China Sea or South China Sea would be an economic and human tragedy unlike any other the world has suffered in the last 50 years. I said at the beginning, Americans want to know what it takes. When it takes is important too. Action now, despite the political, diplomatic, and economic effort is more practical sooner than later. More practical now in peacetime than in crisis. More practical now in peacetime before conflict. The conditions in Ukraine right now are horrific. The country is in ruins. It will be too late to wait until Taiwan is potentially ruined by coercion, by blockade, by missile barrage, by invasion. It will be too late to wait until the global economy is ruined. It is absolutely in our interest to prevent outcomes like these, to act now to deter conflict. We must remember our two nations, the world's largest economy and third largest economies by GDP, have the weight, the standing, the influence with others globally to deter Chairman Xi 
and the Communist Party of China's stated intention to subjugate its neighbors in the region, disrupt the international world order, and replace it with one with Chinese characteristics. It only takes the will of our two nations. Again, I am so pleased by Japan's new security policy and the actions our two nations, our alliance, have taken in these last few months. It is historic. We must continue to assess the security environment constantly, the changes in it that will surely occur, and continue to find the courage, the will, together, to adapt and adjust our security strategies and our alliance. I congratulate Japan on these historic changes these last two months. Thank you for your time and attention today. Thank you. Welcome. I am delighted to see so many familiar faces and the new friends. I understand that, that there are over 400 people listening into this conversation. This is how important this conversation is, uh, uh, particularly uh, 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 the remarks uh, uh, made by Admiral Philip Davison. I am Satohiro Akimoto. I'm a chairman and a president of Sasakawa Peace Foundation USA. Sasakawa USA is a think tank in Washington, D.C. Our mission is to deepening understanding of and strengthening the relationship between Japan and the United States for the good of the international community. Since I became chairman and president three years ago, I was working hard to uh, uh, add a think tank uh, function to our grant giving functions. And one of the uh, most important uh, achievement that I made was uh, uh, to have uh, Mr. Jim Schoff, senior director, joining Sasakawa USA. Jim is uh, uh, spearheading uh, our program, uh, US-Japan uh, Next Alliance Initiative. Uh, his initiative is to uh, 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 look into a future uh, state and shape of U.S.-Japan relationship, security uh, uh, alliance, reflecting a uh, uh, changing element of our geopolitical, geoeconomic situation in Northeast Asia, as well as the importance of uh, technology and uh, competition with uh, uh, China. Admiral Philip Davison, uh, uh, we are delighted to have you on board with the Sasakawa USA as an uh, advisor. And I am delighted that uh, we played a small role in your visiting Japan for the first time as a uh, civilian. More than a small role. <laughs> <laughs> More than a small role. Uh, you know, uh, uh, please allow me to uh, uh, present uh, my short comment, and uh, uh, then I'll invite Jem to uh, do the same, and then I'll ask questions which were gathered by our audience uh, uh, prior to the event. Historic rise of China is probably the most uh, biggest uh, geopolitical and uh, geoeconomic challenge for the uh, free world, at least in the first half of this century. As China become richer, stronger, and more confident about the course and the future of the country, China has become more assertive uh, about realizing its, its national interest and more aggressive about projecting its military and economic power. I think significance of Admiral Davison's remark today, as well as his testimony at the Senate, is to highlight centrality and urgency of the importance of effectively dealing with formidable challenges posed by China. I think this is critical from the viewpoint of maintaining and, and strengthening our way of life as defined by freedom, democracy, rule of law, uh, free enterprise, and transparency. I know, an, an important point to note is while the two wars, uh, invasion, uh, invasion and six years, have been sensationalized and started to have life of its own in the public discourse, uh, including a media coverage. Admiral Davison's analysis is much more nuanced uh, in connection with the domestic power structure and political calendar in China. As a matter of fact, he was asked at the Senate public hearing, not about the invasion per se, but about the potential conflict of all sorts of things. It is worthwhile to emphasize 
His message is not to fight the bloody war, destroy the enemy at all costs, and score victory, but to do our best to deter China from adventurism and avoid devastating military conflict. This is truly a timely occasion to have Admiral Davidson in Japan, as Japan is going through a transformative time in terms of its national security stance, and also convergence of national security strategies between the two countries, United States and Japan. As President Biden and Prime Minister Kishida proudly confirmed uh, earlier this month in Washington. So that's my uh, short comment, and I'd like to uh, uh, invite Jim to uh, uh, present his short comment. Thank you. Well, thank you very much, Akimoto-san. It's a pleasure to be with you all today, honored to be with you two gentlemen on stage. Um, so I, I really enjoyed uh, Admiral Davidson's presentation because for me it, it simplifies things and puts things in, in proper perspective. And it, it's in the title of, of the session today, you know, the role for the U.S.-Japan alliance uh, in today's Indo-Pacific. Indo and I start then, if I think about what the role is, the goal is, as has been mentioned here, deterrence. Oh, I'm sorry, the goal is peace and stability. The role is deterrence. And what I think is meaningful about the two plus two meeting that happened in, in Washington earlier in January is that it's beginning to grapple with the necessary changes to fulfill that role, to, to, to really be able to provide that peace and stability through deterrence. And it's confronting two particular challenges, uncomfortable challenges, uh, that we face. The first is that Japan is truly now on the front line of any conflict in East Asia because of the changes in technology, the proliferation of missiles, and, and together with that being on the front line, not just a rear area, forward area kind of uh, relationship, we're also in an environment where the potential for conflict is higher than it's been in, in recent memory. Uh, the tensions across the Taiwan Strait uh, with North Korea as well. So the, the need to be prepared uh, to deal with this new situation is, is more critical. And I think the two plus two agreements, whether it's the deployment of a Marine littoral regiment, whether it is uh, Japan developing counterstrike capability or a permanent joint headquarters, or even something as simple as a, a, a fully staffed watercraft company of the U.S. Army here in, in Yokohama, it's, it's, it was very hard to understand from the media what that meant. You know, why is that important? The ships have been there for several years. Uh, these are ships that can transport men and material uh, to, to respond to any kind of crisis. But what will happen now is we'll have a permanent company of about 200 uh, members of the U.S. Army who will be there to operate and train and work together with the self-defense forces to be truly practically prepared to respond to these, these challenges that we face. And I think it's this issue of practical preparation, the security of supply arrangement, being able to share uh, equipment uh, and, and inputs for defense and national security needs uh, more easily. This most recent 2 plus 2 has a whole host of, of components to it that I think help us really begin to prepare uh, in a more practical way. It's not going to be easy and it's not going to happen overnight. There are going to be uh, things we have to work out. How do we manage these, this closer integration of security cooperation? Uh, but I think clearly we're on the same page and thinking in a similar way strategically, so I'm very encouraged by that. The other thing I would highlight, and it was referenced as well, in uh, Admiral Davidson's talk, the reference to economic security, uh, the broader agenda of alliance security cooperation, the development of the economic two plus two as a vehicle to help uh, manage this, and then also something that Prime Minister Kishida talked about in Washington when he was there and gave a speech at Johns Hopkins SICE, talking about the broader international community 
having the alliance be there for the global south, for ASEAN, for common prosperity. It's not just about deterrence, it's about common prosperity and, and working towards something positive, not just working against something. And we're still struggling with that on the US side in terms of our trade policy and can we practice economic security without closing ourselves off or you know, having some kind of protectionist type of impact. Uh, I think if we take the time to work together and, and share the ideas and our networks in the region, uh, we have an opportunity to do that. But it's a, it's a, a daunting agenda, but I, I do share your optimism uh, with, with how we are approaching it right now at this time. Thank you very much. Uh, I'm going to ask questions uh, that are uh, presented by viewers and also audience prior to the event, as well as uh, our own questions. First, uh, um, Japan and the United States have come a long way and have a, a convergence of national strategy uh, uh, at a very high level. What are now the uh, priorities that the United States and Japan should be uh, working on? Because uh, uh, on national security related documents, that's a comprehensive and it has so many different points. You know, in your mind, what are the priorities that the United States and Japan should be working on? Well, I think one of the things that immediately jumps out is the commitment in the, the new national security strategy to strengthen alliances and partnerships um, I think globally, but uh, here in the region, absolutely. That's also one of the very important pillars um, uh, and objectives of the United States uh, national defense strategy. Um, there has been improving collaboration and transparency when it comes to those components, whether it be direct aid, indirect aid, loans, direct, uh, materials, um, to other nations uh, like the Philippines um, or to some of the Pacific Island nations. And um, deepening that so that um, uh, it properly equips the region with things that addresses their needs, which vary from climate change, you know, all the way up to the, th the, the threat potential from the People's Republic of China, I think is, um, uh, critically important. I mean, there is a vast array of things to accomplish here um, in these new alliance agreements and in uh, the three uh, new documents, but that's one that can quickly move, um, work through both the military and, and uh, diplomatic um, uh, uh, you know, lanes, spheres, I call them, uh, uh, typically, uh, and, and enable um, deep engagements um, collectively uh, with other nations in the region. Some of the items that uh, uh, um, gather lots of attention is uh, uh, counter-strike capability yeah. uh, or joint uh, uh, headquarters. But uh, uh, these things uh, require lots of detailed coordination between the United States. Can you uh, uh, educate us on uh, what kind of uh, uh, concrete uh, uh, coordination necessary to move forward with these important uh, developments? Yeah, if I if I pull down from you know the the major security strategy down to the military concerns and things like that, um, I I think that, you know there are three uh, very important priorities um, in the document here: uh, the joint permanent headquarters, uh, the development of the counterattack capabilities, and then the cyber and space uh, force and capabilities of, and authorities. All three of these are areas in which we can work closely together. Um, uh, and I'll, uh, on the joint permanent headquarters, of course, the United States transitioning to that kind of structure uh, more than 30 years ago, 35 years ago now, um, I think it, it should be a key priority here in Japan. Um, one, for the political level to properly resource um, and for the services to come together to properly provide the manpower, um, site, um, provide the command and control, and then when I say resource, I mean deliver the authorities and responsibilities to that joint headquarters so that they can statutorily truly be effective. And then the military, the three, the, the branches, 
need to come together to ensure that the influence and spirit of that headquarters in their responsibilities and authorities is all reinforced by them as well. If you have that joint permanent headquarters well established, you're off and running in this new era in which you're integrating not only air, sea, land domains, but you're bringing in space and now cyber into this, which is so critical to the next components. So space and cyber, um, uh, critically important to counterattack uh, or counterstrike capabilities, uh, depending upon your preference. Um, a, a couple of points here, I think, um, Akimoto, uh, Akimoto san. Um, you know, first, um, we have a legacy of cooperation in ballistic missile defense, which frankly integrates information from space assets, from air assets, from land-based radars, from sea-based radars into the interceptions, uh, interceptors and enables ballistic missile defense. We have uh, deep collaboration and cooperation, even technological, co-technological development, co-development, excuse me, um, on this. Um, and then of course, you know, highlighting it all was the very successful shots last fall by the, t by the two Japanese destroyers at the combat uh, systems trials um, off Hawaii. But building from that, the understanding of how those domains are integrated in order to affect the mission in, in uh, ballistic missile defense gives us the ability to cooperate deeply in counterattack and help there. Um, I think two of the other things that um, associated with counterattack that need to happen is the political level needs to work through its policies and then the processes by which um, you know, counterattack capabilities might be applied. And then of course, those political level uh, policies and processes need to connect with the national security level. Um, whether um, it's, uh, and by that I mean both the, the ministry um, as well as the Joint Permanent Headquarters, if they are going to be the ones charged with executing these missions. Um, so I think that's uh, critically important. Uh, I add cyber and space as the third pillar here to the Joint Headquarters uh, and the counterattack capabilities because, again, in our experience in the United States over the, just the last few years here, these require, um, you, you know, really thought through political and statutory um, process, excuse me, policies and processes um, that need to be applied to the national security apparatus so that they can properly um, use these domains um, to effect. Um, this is a lot of work, these three things uh, to happen. Um, some of it is, you know, the political uh, responsibility solely. Some is the, you know, very senior national security apparatus, um, the ministry, of course, the national security advisor, the JJS, um, the, the service chiefs and things like that. And then, you know, how you get it down to the operational and tactical level to affect. There's a lot of work to accomplish, but all must be addressed to be effective. You said a lot of work, but it's a, a really a lot of a lot of a lot of work. Uh, uh, at the end of uh, uh, two plus two uh, uh, in Washington, Secretary Austin apparently said that uh, we have made a great progress, but that means we're going to be very very busy this year. So uh, I guess the uh, devil's in uh, uh, details, and uh, just the coordination between political apparatus. Uh, 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 apparatus and uh, uh, a uniform military apparatus is very difficult thing to do, you know. So I uh, uh, have a great respect for uh, uh, officials both on, uh, uh, on both sides of the Pacific to coordinate. Jim, you look like you want to Could say I something. add just sure. one point, please, uh, Akamoto-san, is uh, the spirit of the two plus two. And the spirit, um, as represented at the press conference between President Biden and uh, Prime Minister Kishida, you know, makes it apparent to me that the U.S. is fully engaged and willing to assist on these matters. And, and I, I think it's going to be important work for the alliance um, to develop other skills that are necessary um, to preserve peace here in the region. Thank you, Jim. Yep, no, no, uh, this is good. Um, I just wanted to pick up on that because, you know, I think there are two things happening at the same time. On the one hand, this is a longer term evolution of the alliance that we're putting into motion in the same way that 
you could say the 1995 2 plus 2 was pivotal. That was the first one that had uh, all cabinet members uh, in attendance uh, from, from both sides. And they laid the groundwork for the 1996 Joint Declaration on Security that Clinton and Hashimoto signed, which really, to deal with the changing threat from North Korea, led to the situations in areas surrounding Japan. And you know, this was a multi-year kind of evolution of both legal and alliance cooperation uh, changes. We may be in the, the beginning stages of something like that as well. But on the other hand, there are these near-term challenges. Uh, Admiral Davidson described them. It, these are priorities. So these are things that we need to get better at as soon as possible in terms of this cross-domain working, pulling together the space and cyber with uh, uh, the sea and air uh, domains as well. The good news is, I think, you know, we do have existing mechanisms. Admiral Davidson referenced the missile defense mission uh, that we work together on. We have uh, a, a, a North Korea sanctions enforcement operation that u utilizes the USS Blue Ridge that's here uh, in, in Japan with, with other international partners uh, coordinating and cooperating. Um, we have the alliance coordination mechanism. We've been training in some of the newer exercises to, uh, to, to utilize uh, these new components. So there's a foundation to build from and pieces we can innovate and put together to deal with challenges in the near term, but at the same time, we have to keep working toward this longer term evolution of the alliance, I believe. Thank you very much. We've been talking about uh, uh, increased the defense budget from 1% to 2%, you know, enemy uh, 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 counter strike capability, and so on and so forth. But uh, uh, you've been always talking about the importance of deterrence. You know, uh, could you, would you like to uh, uh, elaborate on that? Rather, rather than having uh, attacking capability and so on and so forth. I mean, really, it's, it's you know, the, the deterrence that's required goes well beyond the military sphere, right? It is the bringing together of the diplomatic, the informational, the military, uh, and the economic tools um, that preserve the peace and create the kind of leverage that's necessary for all parties to want to continue to develop uh, economically and provide prosperity for their people and, and pull people out of poverty. And again, you know, I cited some of the agreements that we've uh, uh, that were discussed in Washington here two weeks ago with uh, biotech and supply chain and semiconductor and artificial intelligence and other things. Um, but you know, the next level is ensuring the collaboration and uh, uh, cooperation and coordination between our two nations to kind of align those four pillars, diplomatic, informational, military, and economic, in order to be an effective deterrent tool overall. You have a comment or you don't? No. Have, no. Uh, you know, uh, we've been having a series of meetings in Tokyo and uh, Admiral Davidson said that Japanese are too humble. You know, that uh, this is a historic development that Jap Japanese have achieved so much that we should be proud of, you know. but. Uh, uh, What's the reaction to uh, 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 Japanese uh, uh, transformative change to uh, uh, national security stance in, uh, uh, in the United States? Perhaps I will ask uh, Jim first, because you live in Washington. Very quickly, what's the reaction from Washington? Well, the, the reaction is, is quite positive, you know, as, as you can imagine. Um, you know, I would put this 2 plus 2 in the top four of 2 plus 2s, um, and people in Washington keep track of things like this. Uh, the 95, uh, as I mentioned, uh, but 2005, 2006, when the realignment roadmap was, was put together, and then of course 2015 with the adoption of, of uh, the current defense guidelines that we have. Um, the, the maritime, uh, the Marine Littoral Regiment, the MLR for example, you know, this is something that the Marines came to the Defense Department and said, we want to do this. Um, they've been putting this kind of new uh, uh, combat unit together in the region. Um, I think there's one in Hawaii, right? As, as I, uh, and they, they wanted to have one in Japan, and this was over a year ago. So it was a process of working together in the alliance, through the alliance managers, figuring out what's the right 
the best way to do it. There was interest in Japan. And I think this kind of timeline of that kind of decision and movement is, is new, and it's responding to the challenges. And, and Ukraine, uh, Russia's attack on Ukraine is, is a major catalyst, uh, as is China's behavior uh, in the region. And that's just one component of a long list of things that, that have come out of uh, this two plus two. So um, there is recognition that, that there's a lot of work to do, uh, and it's competing with all these other uh, priorities on the economic security front uh, that politicians and, and others have to pay attention to, but um, it's, it's going to get the resources that it needs on the U.S. side. I'm going to agree with Jim, but narrow it and put it at number one in two plus two history. That's for sure. <laughs> Great. Uh, Admiral Davidson, uh, uh, you attended uh, uh, Naval Academy. Your brother attended the Naval Academy. Uh, could you talk about the uh, uh, importance of public service, particularly for the uh, young people? Uh, you know, we've been talking about a uh, uh, dangerous world and uh, uh, potential conflict and so on and so forth. That means uh, 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 precious lives uh, will be put on the test. And, uh, uh, you know, uh, as uh, all of us know from uh, uh, tables of exercise, and you know uh, uh, from your own experience, uh, uh, battlefield can be a very messy place, you know. Uh, uh, what's your uh, uh, message to uh, uh, young people who are thinking about uh, public service? Um, uh, thank you for that. I uh, retired in May of 2021 after 39 years of active naval service and another four years in addition to that wearing a uniform as a young midshipman. So between the ages of 18 and 61, uh, I was in uh, the uniform of my country, uh, the cloth of our nation, we frequently say in the Navy. Um, and I consider it a great privilege to have served that long. Along that journey, I also had the great privilege to serve in the White House uh, uh, for the office of the Vice President, as well as uh, be assigned to the State Department and work there. So I've seen uh, diplomats, policymakers, bureaucrats, um, and people in uniform, men and women, in, in all three career paths, uh, perform their duties. And I found all of, all of that incredibly rewarding and gratifying uh, because uh, people are going to work for their country knowing uh, that um, their respective missions you know, shaped in our case by the Constitution of the United States is worthy and um, is a worthy and noble goal. And um, part of the energy that's derived from working in organizations like that, whether it's in the Foreign Service, whether it's as a bureaucrat in one of the other organizations in Washington um, or um, uh, in uniform, is having um, your coworkers, you know, be like-minded and as committed to the mission, um, and as excited by the challenges that exist, whether they be extraordinary threats, some of which we described uh, here today, um, or the hard work of Im improving um, the living standards um, elsewhere um, in the United States and things like that. Um, it, it, it was an extraordinary and long chapter in my life, and I couldn't be more grateful to uh, have done it. You know, it's, it's interesting. When you talk about that, clearly the Navy is very international. You were, you know, serving all over the world and serving, at working together with other countries. A lot of other areas of service traditionally are more domestic-oriented, but in today's world are becoming international, yeah. you know, and so whether it's telecom or agriculture or energy. Uh, so the international dimension of public service, I think, is, is an interesting component. And at the same time, as we move towards, I, I alluded to this before, the economic security measures, whether it's uh, looking at domestic subsidies or um, investment restrictions or restrictions on outbound investment, and how do we coordinate this in a way that is serves American interests or serves Japanese interests, but also 
is in coordination and in harmony with other partners, other countries. This is not easy to do. We all have slightly different political imperatives and uh, economic interests and, and domestic interests. So we need public servants and people who have that perspective and political leaders who are able to then explain to the voters and, and to be able to combine this um, self-help, international cooperation uh, uh, movement forward. And I'll put in one plug uh, for embassies and the role of embassies. Um, I think there was a period of time with technology and travel where the embassies to some extent were playing less of a role in international, international relations. But now the issues are so complex. Um, you know, especially in supply chain management and uh, uh, energy security and other areas, the embassies are the, the, the most tightly knit interagency bodies that each country has with a, a single mission, which is improving the relationship with that other country. So I think the, the role of embassies as a, as a coordination body among all these different stakeholders uh, in these complex, issue, complex issues could be, um, could be an interesting theme going forward. Uh, if I could add one thing, Akimoto-san, it's not necessary to serve for 40 years either. Um, you know, I, I frequently said to servicemen and women, whether you serve four years or 40 years, um, it is the privilege of serving your country, understanding the nobleness of its constitution and the importance of its control over its sovereignty, and then having that um, deep background in your experience as you proceed in business or in education or whatever your objective is, I think is um, very, very important and, and leaves young people with options um, for the future. Do you see a, a same level of interest and the same level of commitment from uh, uh, um, young people joining uh, uh, U.S. military forces. You know, I'm always staggered by how smart they are <laughs> and wish I was that smart and that motivated uh, when I was uh, their age. Um, I, I have the highest level of confidence and optimism in our armed forces in the United States, even when faced like challenges I described at the podium. Um, they are enthusiastic, they are smart, and they love their country, and I couldn't have been more proud to have served with them through the course of my whole time in uniform. I'm sure that uh, Japan has also uh, uh, such young people uh, trying to uh, serve the country right. You know, I just wanted to say that uh, uh, I see uh, uh, Mr. Roskam, Mr. Gonzalez from uh, U.S. Embassy. I was uh, uh, privileged to uh, uh, take uh, uh, 60 Ivy League student to the embassy last week and uh, they are talking about the importance of diplomacy. They are encouraging students to go into, uh, uh, choose uh, uh, a path of uh, uh, becoming a, a diplomat as a, as a career path. And uh, uh, I see the similarity uh, between your comment and uh, uh, their comment, so I uh, appreciated that, so thank you. Uh, last comment, uh, last question is uh, uh, going back to the uh, title of your speech, Ukraine uh, and uh, um, China or East Asia. What will be the uh, lesson uh, uh, that the United States and Japan uh, uh, learn from uh, uh, Russian invasion in Ukraine? What could be uh, translated into uh, deterrence and other uh, uh, areas uh, in East Asia? Yeah, I, I touched on it briefly during, uh, during my talk, but it, it's, it's the power of the international order and uh, the importance of its will in coming together on issues like these. Um, people can um, spend a few days talking about leopard tanks in the latest instance, but this is resolving and going to resolve. And it's just the hard work of what we expect out of our uniformed people that staff Alliance headquarters like that and our diplomats uh, to work through, but it gets worked through. And when you have that unanimity within the Alliance, it shows how powerful it actually is. Um, very, very uh, Im important work to see that. And it, it's my number one takeaway and gives me great confidence with the challenges that are here in the Indo-Pacific as well. Thank you, Jim. Yeah, it, you know, it's interesting. Just last night I was a part of this discussion. Um, I had to do it virtually because I was here uh, 
back in the U.S., a project that is translating a lot of contemporary Chinese scholars' writings about regional international relations. And in particular, this particular session was focused on Japan-Taiwan relations. So it was a series of articles that Chinese scholars are writing for their peers, foreign policy specialists, uh, about trends in Japan-Taiwan relations. And, and it was depressing in many ways because of how dismissive the Chinese scholars are. Of course, they have to work within a, a, a kind of a censored environment, but they, they often would talk about how the Japanese like to use the term universal values or the international order, and they dismissed it as, as rhetoric or as a, as a slogan simply to try to uh, confront China or hold China down. And, and to me, you know, I, I wholeheartedly agree. It's that there's real substance behind the international order and universal values, and it's it's a meaningful thing for us to work towards and work in service of. And I think the response to uh, Russia demonstrates that being shared uh, more broadly, and hopefully we can demonstrate the same kind of resolve in advance towards China so that we don't have to endure some kind of situation like that. And, and that's, uh, that's the goal as far as I could see it. Thank you very much. I would like to invite now uh, Admiral Davison to have a final word. But uh, before that, now I just wanted to uh, uh, thank everybody who are here listening to this conversation, and also uh, Mr. Tsunami, his leadership at the uh, Sasagawa Peace Foundation in Tokyo, and also his desire to uh, uh, collaborate with the uh, Sasagawa Peace Foundation USA. We had uh, uh, Hillary Clinton, Secretary Hillary Clinton, here in October, and we had determined to uh, 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 work together with the Sasaka uh, uh, Peace Foundation in Tokyo and Sasaka Peace Foundation USA to make it uh, uh, bigger and uh, uh, um, in terms of uh, quality of the event, in terms of uh, uh, number of event we are going to have. And uh, I am uh, uh, so proud to have uh, uh, Admiral Davidson as a member of our advisory board. And you have a final word. Uh, uh, thank you. First, again, uh, uh, Dr. Tsunami, uh, thank you so much uh, for today, your very gracious introduction and the tremendous um, audience, both uh, here in person today and virtually. Um, I said at the beginning of my speech, I couldn't be more proud to be associated with the uh, Sasakawa Peace Foundation USA um, and the Sasakawa Peace Foundation, so committed to deepening the relationship between our two nations and ultimately deepening our alliance, something that Jim has actually working on um, we're here with the Sasakawa Peace Foundation and, and um, uh, other J Japanese entities here in town. Um, so I think that's phenomenal. Uh, second, um, I am an optimist, and I meant what I said. And I think this is within the capabilities of our two nations to handle um, the security environment out here in the Western Pacific. And, um, I couldn't be more pleased to have worked with Japan um, for nearly, I won't tell any sea stories, but going back to the very beginnings of my service in uh, 1982, but certainly as my time uh, in the, uh, uh, as the commander of US Indo-Pacific Command. And I look forward to seeing your success uh, in the future. Thank you so much. Well, thank you very much. And uh, I would like to close the event. So thank you everybody for coming and appreciate it. Thank you very much.